so good afternoon, just barely. Uh, I'm Jonathan Fung from the Department of Physics and Astronomy, and it's my great pleasure on behalf of the organizing committee of the uh, What Matters to Me and Why series to welcome you to this, our, I think it's our fifth installment of this first season. First, some uh, general announcements. You all have lunches, or at least you, many of you do. Uh, please bring those with you when you leave. I'd like to be good stewards of this uh, nice, nice room we have here. Uh, second of all, the talk is being filmed, as you can see. And so uh, I think there were signs telling you that by walking in here, you've consented to being filmed. Um, if that's troubling to you, please move to the back, and then you won't appear very visibly on anything. But I uh, hope you're OK with that. And third, we will have a question and answer session, of course. And there will be a roving microphone. So please hold off for a few seconds before the, until the microphone gets to you, and then you will appear uh, nice and loud on the videotape. OK, so now on to the talk. As staff, faculty, and students, we spend much of our time here at UCI dealing with exams, homework, lectures, budgets, research, personnel, and all sorts of other good topics, doing the things that are required to keep the university going and our careers running. What Matters to Me and Why is a chance to take a few minutes each month to stop and take a bit of a break uh, from our usual frenetic activity. Every month we have the opportunity to hear from someone at the, in the UCI community who will um, give a short informal talk followed by plenty of time for discussion. The talk has no prescribed topic. It's simply the question put to the speaker is what matters to you and why? And we encourage them to take that wherever it goes, um, as long as they're uh, willing to be frank and sincere and truthful. And it's guaranteed always to be a fascinating talk. Uh, speakers typically will talk about uh, their values, beliefs, motivations, perhaps how those have been shaped by their personal histories. And it's hoped that by doing this uh, at UCI, we will strengthen bonds between the faculty, students, and staff who work and teach and learn here and also that it would celebrate both the tremendous diversity we have here on campus and also the commonalities that bind us together. As I said, these talks are monthly. If you registered, you probably saw the schedule. Uh, in the next talk, which will be on April 10th, another Wednesday at noon, we are going to have uh, Noguki Wat Yango, distinguished professor of English and comparative literature, who is also a renowned literary and social activist speaking. So that should be wonderful. I hope you sign up for that. And uh, now, let me, without further ado, introduce Justin Chung, who will introduce our speaker. Justin is a member of the uh, What Matters to Me and Why organizing committee, but he is also a doctoral student in informatics, and he's president of the Associated Graduate Students Association. So please welcome Justin. Thanks, Jonathan. So today I have the pleasure of introducing uh, Dr. Paul Dourish, who is professor of informatics and also has appointments in computer science and anthropology. And um, a native Glaswegian, Paul worked at Xerox Euro Park for a number of years and uh, received his PhD at UCL in London. And after getting his degree, uh, he came to the US and worked at Apple Computer and also Xerox Park, uh, a research center you may know as the place where graphical user interfaces, um, laser printers, and uh, um, Ethernet were invented, among other things. And after a few years, he made the jump to academia, joining the faculty here in information and computer science. Here his research lies at the intersection of computer science and social science, with a particular interest in ubiquitous computing and the cultural practices surrounding new media. So he's among the most prolific and widely cited scholars in human-computer interaction. He holds 19 US patents. Microsoft's academic search system has him listed as the fourth most influential author in the field. And in 2002, he received an NSF Career Award. In 2008, he was elected to the Chi Academy in recognition of his contributions to the field. Most recently, he became co-director of the new Intel Science and Technology Center for Social Computing, which is a multi-campus $12.5 million research center, research collaboration anchored here at UCI. So finally, on his website, uh, he continues to proudly proclaim that according to an anonymous student reviewer, 
Uh, he is by far the most eccentric professor in ICS. <laughs> so please join me today in welcoming Dr. Paul Dorish. I should take that off my website, but I'm particularly proud of it because the competition for most eccentric professor in ICS is fairly fierce. <laughs> um, so let's see, I was, I was thinking about this, you know, this month I am doing two invited distinguished lectures at Australian universities. I've got a one conference keynote talk that I'm doing. I was spent all day yesterday at an industry event where I was telling them what we were doing in our um, new research center as well as all my usual teaching. And this talk makes me by far more nervous than any of those because it is certainly far outside the sorts of talk that, um, that, that I normally called upon to give. So I have my security blanket here, which I don't, is not normally the way I give talks, but um, hopefully I won't need it too much. Let's see. Um, I'll take those off so I can't see you all. Um, <laughs> so, so let's see. I mean, the best way to sort of think about this, perhaps, is sort of biographically and see what sort of comes up along the, along the way. So I, I was born and grew up in, in Glasgow on the west coast of Scotland. Um, and, and where my family, my family still lives, so I still make, back, make it back there uh, reasonably often. At that time, in the 70s and 80s, uh, uh, Glasgow was suffering from a lot of problems. So it was suffering... Um, on one level from a lot of economic problems, having been a city that had, uh, whose economy was based on heavy industry um, in the earlier part of the century, on coal mining, on steel making, on shipbuilding. Um, and now I live in, in Long Beach near to the Queen Mary, which proudly proclaims its Glaswegian heritage in the, in the, in the, ship, the shipbuilding industry. So it was sort of very economically depressed at the time. The city also suffered from um, a sort of second major problem, which was sectarianism. So a lot of the things of the kinds of um, militant and violent sectarianism that we associate with Northern Ireland and the troubles there sort of spilled over onto the west coast of Scotland. There was a lot of traffic back and forth between uh, the west Western Scotland and Northern Ireland. And, you know, in many ways it wasn't until I left that I realized just how odd that was. Right? So actually, after my first couple of years away, I went back, and I was back in um, the center of Glasgow with uh, showing, you know, showing a friend around, um, and an orange march went by. And an orange march is one of these marches by, um, by militant uh, Protestant groups celebrating a 400-year-old Irish battle at which Catholic armies were routed. Um, and, 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 the, and the strange sort of moment of dissonance that occurred to me was, this was perfectly normal and yet clearly very abnormal. Um, so, so that was a sort of odd kind of thing to grow up with. Uh, I should say, not because I'm in the pay of the Scottish Tourist Board, but because it probably uh, is a good idea. Anyway, the Glasgow of today is a very different place. Um, although it's kind of hard, I find, when I go back, not to see the Glasgow that I very explicitly left. Um, so. I grew up as the as the eldest of four um, in in a family in which education was very important. My parents were both in the first generation in their families to attend uh, attend university, and they were themselves both teachers. Um, my my mother taught science, taught chemistry. My father taught classics. So I sort of had the sciences and the humanities both covered. Um, and and it was clear I wasn't going to get away with slacking in either of those in either of those areas. Um, in fact, my mother trained. She she undertook teacher training um, when I was in my late teens, and I remember reading all of her uh, all of her teaching textbooks, which I don't think probably did me any good now or does my has any benefit to my students. Although it certainly um, added an extra sort of filter and layer to my own classroom experience at the time as a, as a pupil. I was like, oh, I know where you got that from. I can put that in the book. Um, so I attended a high school that, oddly, my father had also attended not only as a pupil, but it was also where he had started his teaching career. And in fact, many of the pupils that he had taught subsequently became my teachers. Um, in fact, of the four teachers who taught me Latin, two had been taught Latin by my father. One had taught Latin alongside my father. And the fourth was, had arrived at the school as a student teacher to replace my father when my father moved on to another, to another position. 
Um, so the combination of that and the fact that I have a relatively unusual surname made it fairly clear to me straight off that I wasn't going to be able to sort of fly under the radar there. Um, that was the unfortunate discovery of pretty much my first week of school. It's like, oh, okay, everybody already knows who I am. Um, the school was run by Jesuits. Um, the Jesuits, as many of you will know, are, um, uh, run a lot of schools. It's a, it's a, a Catholic order of priests. Um, amongst the most vigorously intellectual of, um, of, of Catholic seminarians. Um, so the emphasis there on educational attainment um, was also very strong, um, but always then placed in the context of, of religious devotion as well. So we were all you know, trained to write every page of, in, every page of anything we had to hand in um, would be marked AMDG, which stands for Ad Maioram Dei Gloriam, for the greater, to the greater glory of God. Um, now, I'd say my, my sort of approximate hypothesis in the result of, as a result of Jesuit education is that most, peop most people come out of Jesuit education either as priests themselves or militant atheists. <laughs> and, um, and I'm clearly not a priest. <laughs> Uh, it, uh, and the, and the, actually, I distinctly remember the last year of, last year of school, um, the teacher we had, at, at a young, enthusiastic um, Jesuit novice uh, teaching us religious education, decided to structure our last two terms. Um, first, around one term, exploring all the arguments against the existence of God, and in the second term, exploring all the counter-arguments in favour of the existence of God, and I'm afraid I found the first term much more compelling. So, so I did not emerge as a as, as a priest from that. I did, however, at school in about 1980, sort of first encounter a computer, always in the story of any computer scientist, always one of these sort of seminal moments. There was a microcomputer there, a Commodore PET, which I still have a certain kind of fondness. Um, and a small group of us, uh, you know, began to explore what we could do with it and what kind of things it could, what kind of things it could do. And it was a hobby that sort of quickly quickly mushroomed until it was sort of taking over ridiculous amounts of our lives um, in kind of strange ways as well. So for instance, one of the computer programs I wrote tabulated people's grades, um, um, marks in all their tests across the school, um, which oddly enrolled me into the school's administrative processes at the same time as its educational processes, which was a sort of um, um, an odd thing. And of course, it also became, you know, computers became the site of typical teenage angst and rebellion. I have a memory of a of a um, a summer a particularly dull from my perspective summer holiday, um, which I spent by retreating into a book and writing in, excru in, in excruciating detail in a, a long assembly language program for a, a compiler for the fourth programming language without even actually having a computer around. I just had pages and pages and pages of this um, inscrutable computer program, which I then came home, typed in, and worked. A fact from which I still derive an utterly ridiculous amount of pleasure. So. I, <laughs> I'm glad to have this opportunity once again to bring it up. <laughs> um, however, that was still very much a hobby. I was, I thought, destined for medical school. I'd pretty much, since I was about aged eight, been always told that I was going to medical school. Um, the university admissions process in the UK, especially in Scotland actually at that time, is somewhat different than it was here. So um, I, I actually applied to, applied to university at first, only two medical schools and was accepted, but then chose not to attend and chose to um, stay another year in, um, in, in high school. Uh, and when I reapplied, I then reapplied to computer science programs because in the meantime, my biology teacher, oddly enough, had been the person who said, you're really interested in this. You seem to be quite good at it. Is that what you're going to do at college? And it was a kind of shocking moment because it has simply never occurred to me this thing that I enjoyed might actually become something that I did. Um, my parents, on the other hand, were skeptical, to say the least. Uh, but nonetheless, and especially skeptical, perhaps, because I wanted to go and study computer science at Edinburgh. Now, it always seems ridiculous to me, living in Southern California, um, that, that you know, Glasgow and Edinburgh are only 40 miles apart, and yet culturally there's, there could be no greater gulf. Now, I know in Los Angeles we'll all happily drive 40 miles for dessert, but uh, <laughs> the idea that I was going to, uh, going to leave Glasgow, which also actually got to the university as the largest home resident student population in the UK, or did at the time, um, leave Glasgow and, and go and study in Edinburgh. Edinburgh, of all places. 
um, um, was, uh, was, was somewhat controversial. Um, and in the end, actually, the only thing that mitigated it was, uh, at the time, Edinburgh, so Edinburgh has a fabulous computer science department. At the t and so does Glasgow now. But at the time, Glasgow um, was not doing nearly so well. My father, in his capacity as a high school principal, had the opportunity to tour the university and, and from some conference that he was doing and chose to tour the computer science department where one of the lecturers said, yeah, your son should go to Edinburgh. So that was sort of, that, that kind of made it, made it okay. Um, the other thing, of course, from my perspective was that Edinburgh was also a traditional home of research in the United Kingdom into artificial intelligence. In most places, AI is a subfield of computer science. In most places, there are people who do AI-associated research in computer science. Um, in Edinburgh, it was actually a whole separate department and had a very long, a very long history. And the notion of AI appealed, I would say, to my adolescent self, expressing as it does certain kinds of <coughs> angst of self-knowledge and mastery which at that age seemed really important. Um, and so, so I was uh, extremely eager to, uh, to go to Edinburgh and was very happy then to move that whole 40 miles um, to the entire other side of the world. <laughs> um, Edinburgh's a wonderful place. Okay, if I, if, if I was saying less than positive things about Glasgow as a place to be, I would say very positive things about Edinburgh as a place to be. I love, I love Edinburgh, and I actually in many ways regard it more now as home than I do Glasgow, despite the fact that um, most of my family are still in Glasgow. The program um, there was much more structured than, uh, than, uh, than those that we have here. I was actually quite surprised, I have to say, when I first encountered US academia and realized just how much flexibility and freedom our students have. I was, as I recall, in the fourth year of my undergraduate program before I ever had a choice about what classes I might be able to take um, between two. Oddly, the class I chose not to take is in the area that I now work, um, <laughs> which, I, which, I, which I will come back to, actually, because it's, because it's relevant. But I began as a double major in computer science and electrical engineering. Um, until mathematics kicked my butt, and in particular a second year math class that was famous in the university as being the most advanced math class taken by people who didn't really want to be mathematicians. Um, and, and I wasn't really enjoying that very much. And I discovered um, on the grapevine that there was a new double major being proposed on campus in computer science and artificial intelligence, and I thought I could switch over to that, which I did, but it involved taking um, a year out of my studies um, because the new major hadn't come on stream yet. So I got myself a job in a research center at the university um, as, a, as a systems programmer, um, which technically was classed as an academic position. So I ended up in the curious administrative position of being a member of staff, a member of faculty, essentially, um, and, um, and an undergraduate student in the same department at the same time. Um, which, which caused their computer systems a lot of, a lot of trouble. Uh, but I say, you know, I, I sort of say it quite casually that I sort of took this year out and then re-enrolled um, in, in computer science and artificial intelligence. But actually it was a, a much more complicated decision and one that came at a certain kind of personal cost as well. Um, so, so my parents' skepticism about computer science as a, as a good career move for me um, was nothing to their skepticism um, about the idea that I would inter then interrupt those studies for a year to take a degree program that didn't yet exist, um, um, and which also came at sort of the same time as my severing final relations with the Catholic Church. And so that all put a, it created an, or, a, a, an enormous breach between us, actually, um, one, that, uh, one that took several years to resolve. Um, and, and left me in a sort of serious quandary about whether, whether I was making, making the right decision. Um, it's something that actually sort of has echoed on down the, down the years, even though it's long since resolved now. Um, but, it was a, but that was a sort of difficult, a difficult decision. Um, but, you know, it's one of these things that, um, that I sort of think back, back upon a lot now. I noticed after a while that my own graduate students have tended to, uh, that is, the graduate students who, who um, end up affiliating with me or migrate towards me, have tended either to have taken really bizarre combinations of undergraduate majors, you know, religious studies and astronomy and, you know, philosophy and waffle making or whatever, but, um, <laughs> but also to have, often to have had points where they made these kinds of shifts. And so I actually think it's, you know, it turns out, 
in retrospect, I think, to be important and useful to have had that moment where you actually get to stop and say, do I want to be on the path that I'm on now? Would I rather be on a different path? Is there something else that would make me a little more, um, a, a more comfortable, more happy, more productive? Um, and so I think that sort of switch over is kind of, um, is kind of important. So I, so I returned to my studies, and I carried on actually working for the university um, through my time there, which turned out to be valuable in at least three ways. Um, one is simply financially, it paid me through university. Um, the second is that it provided me with a lot of useful experience working in research groups and sort of solidified my, my feeling of uh, that sort of research was a, was a career direction that I wanted to, uh, wanted to continue in. And the third, although I didn't realize it at the time, was that it gave me exposure to a very bizarre and unusual computer system um, um, made by Xerox, computers that were dedicated to a long, a, a dusty programming language called Lisp that very few of us remember anymore. Um, but uh, this actually ended up being really significant. So at the end of my degree, I got, I um, was looking for jobs and applying in for many sort of traditional software engineering computer programmer jobs. But I had, um, on the basis of, or from people I'd met at the university, I heard that Xerox had recently opened a research lab in um, Cambridge in England. And as Justin pointed out in his, um, in his introduction, this lab was a spin-off from a lab in Palo Alto called Xerox Park, which is famous in the annals of computer science as the place in the 1970s that sort of invented the modern computer workstation and networked architectures and all sorts of things with which we were um, familiar when doing user interface. You may well have heard the stories somewhat apocryphal about how Apple stole the user interface from Xerox Park. So that's the place. This lab was a, was a satellite lab of Park that was devoted to user interface and human computer interaction research, but in a really interesting way that it brought together computer scientists, sociologists, and psychologists to undertake interdisciplinary study of the user interfaces and their, and their consequences. Um, so from my position in Edinburgh, I had two advantages, right? So one was I was working alongside people who had worked or continued to work with folk from Xerox Park, so I could activate my social network and draw on those kinds of connections. And the other was that lab in England was using these same bizarre computers that I happened to be one of the, you know, there can't have been more than 200 of them in the UK at all, so I was one of the few people who knew how to use them, um, which, uh, which helped me get, get in there. So it was an odd kind of thing because I moved, so I moved to England, I moved to take up this job at a research lab. I was the only person there without a PhD. Um, I was coming straight out of my undergraduate degree into a job that sort of started off as half systems programming and half research and became, within a few months, a full-time research position. Um, but before I did my PhD, and in many ways Xerox was sort of grad school for me. I was working with a really kind of amazed, an amazing set of people. Um, and both in Cambridge and also in Palo Alto as I would sort of come back and forth. And I would say I sort of picked up three lessons from there that have been very important in my subsequent work. So the first is that the most interesting and effective solutions to complicated problems tend to come from an interdisciplinary perspective. As I say, we were a fairly small lab actually, about 20 people, but, um, but roughly mixed computer scientists, psychologists, and sociologists. Um, and people sometimes ask me now, because my work has always had this interdisciplinary flavor, um, how is it that you came to that, or how is it that you decided that that was the right way to work? And I never came to it, nor decided that was the right way to work, because I never grew up with an environment in which anything else ever happened. It was simply the way things were. There were all these psychologists and weirdo sociologists. And, um, and you just kind of had, you know, we were all working on things together. I also kind of learned in the course of that that a lot of this actually lies in language, in how we express ourselves and in how we frame problems, how we communicate, and that the challenge for doing interdisciplinary work was to learn to speak the language that people um, spoke. I have a distinct memory of, um, there was a sociologist I worked with there for several years, um, and one day, having been studying up on his area, one day as we we're in a meeting, I said something that you know, sounded like the sort of thing that he would say. And he suddenly turned to me as if a dog had just spoken. It was kind of this bizarre thing. It was like, this person actually talks in a language I understand. Um, and so I've always <laughs> tried to persist to get my students to learn how to talk like the other person, learn how to listen, not just to interpret everybody into our own terms, but to actually sort of become kind of bi bilingual. So that was the first thing I'd learned, is that sort of importance of interdisciplinarity. Um, 
The second is another thing that just that again just kind of happened. As I said, this was a very small lab, about twenty people. But the first time I went to an academic conference of at that time around four thousand people, <laughs> um, our lab had more papers at that conference than they were, than anyone else, and that just seemed normal to me. That is, that I ha I lucked out into a job where I was just working with the world's best people in this in in this area, and the idea and expectation that one should simply be doing that kind of work or aspiring to that was again just something that happened naturally. Um, uh, uh, you know that is and and. There's a guy called Ted, sorry, I'm going way off piece here. Um, there's a guy called Ted Nelson who's uh, uh, famous for his invention of hypertext. And he turned up a few years ago at the big hypertext conference and said to people, his line, the opening line for his keynote was, the purpose of hypertext research is to save the world. Um, and I've, the thing is, I've never seen any reason not to be thinking on a grand scale about the work that we do. Right? Uh, uh, you know, no reason not to be doing work that I you know, tell people you, know, you should be thinking about who's going to be citing your paper, not next year, but in 10 years or 20 years time. You know, the idea that we just do work on that level was sort of part and parcel of how that lab worked. And then the third thing I took away from my work there was the idea that research is a communal activity. We think of it almost like, you know, the artist so alone in his garret, right? The scientist alone in his lab, the person absorbed into the world of the computer system in front of them. Um, but not only did we work collaboratively in that lab, but there was a cycling of people through the lab, visitor, academic visitors, people giving talks, us going to other places. I realize now when I look at my collection of colleagues that there are many people amongst them um, who I've been working with for 20 years, whom I met during that period, and we've always been part of the same research community, even as our affiliations have changed um, three, or four, three or four times. Again, this is something that actually often disappoints my students when I point out that their colleagues now will continue to be their colleagues in the future, and that they actually have as much to learn from each other as they have from me, which sort of goes against the grain in some ways, because it's like, am I the professor? Shouldn't I be telling them things? Um, but, and I do tell them things. Uh, but the idea that research is actually a communal activity, that to a certain extent we're all in it together, was another big thing to bring out of that. So towards the end of my time at Xerox, um, I also completed my PhD. Normally, one would tell a story here that in which taking one's PhD was a much more significant thing. But as I said, Xerox was really my grad school, um, um, even though my, my, my collaborations with people at UCL were, were extremely important. And when that finished up, I moved to the US to take up a position at, at Apple, um, where I was working, oddly, with a whole bunch of people I'd worked with at Xerox who had followed the well-trodden path from Palo Alto down to Cupertino. Um, but uh, the research lab I worked at at Apple closed down after a, after a year. Um, Steve Jobs came back to the company. Steve has never, was never a big supporter of, of, of research because he feels that, re that Apple can absorb research without necessarily doing it itself. And I have to say that Apple did very well after it laid me off. So I really can't fault him for that decision. I didn't use Apple computers before that time, and now I do all the time. So, you know, hey, good. Yeah, it's like, yeah, I... <laughs> It was difficult at the time, but in retrospect, I can't, dis I can't disagree. So I moved back up the road to Palo Alto to Xerox Park and, um, and took up a position, a position there. So I often think that I worked for Xerox for 11 years, this little one-year sabbatical at Apple. Um, and, and, and discovered an odd thing when I interviewed at Park which is that as I interviewed, people would often have to take me to, the, you know, to meet with the next person who was going to be interviewing interviewing me, and they couldn't find their way to, their, to this person's office, but I could. I'd had the advantage when I'd been in England, whenever I came to park, I, I wanted to absorb as much as what was going on. I talked to as many people as I possibly could, and I just knew my way around the building better than people who'd actually been there. So there was a lesson for me there. When I get here, I don't want to be like that. I want to actually make sure that I sort of move around and move around in the building a good deal. So I had um, three extremely productive and, um, and enjoyable years at Xerox, worked with a huge, a great set of people who, again, are still um, important colleagues for me, including even now in our new um, Intel uh, venture. Uh, one, of the, my, one of my peers at one of the other Intel labs is actually a former Xerox colleague. Um, until one day, uh, you know, the, the, well, let's see, Xerox was a more supportive and, and, and um, stable environment than Apple was, but it was changing as well. It was changing without a greater emphasis on, on corporate applicability of the research that we did. And one day I saw a graph um, in a meeting um, projected on a PowerPoint slide, uh, which showed it was a graph of um, publications coming out of Xerox over the, the most recent period. And I realized that A, this graph was, you know, I can draw it for you, seriously declining. 
um, and B, that I had written a quarter of all the publications to come out of my research lab in the previous year, um, and that maybe if the academic stuff was important to me, I should be in academia. Um, so I decided to sort of move over, and, and um, I'd been to UCI many times. I had uh, good collaborations with people here, so it was an obvious place to come. However, I remember distinctly a point after I had made that decision, accepted the position here, um, I was, I can't remember, in transit somewhere, in some airport in the middle of the country, and I'm sitting there and suddenly going, huh, this is actually a different job. I just sort of thought of this as moving from one research facility to another research facility, but there's a whole bunch of other things going on. I work now, or encounter through my teaching and other things, more actual human beings in the course of a year, numerically, than I would in 10 years at Xerox. Um, you know, there's just a lot of people coming and going. There's a whole different set of skills involved. Um, and it was a disturbing moment. But it's been good. It's been good. Coming to UCI was also a sort of a moment for me to, um, to think about what sort of work I was doing and where I wanted to sort of position myself um, intellectually. I said that it was only in the fourth year of my undergraduate degree that I ever actually got to make a choice about what class I was going to take next. And the choice was between a class in human-computer interaction, which, as I say, is now my major research field, um, and a class on the mathematics of um, parallel computer systems. And I took the class in the mathematics of parallel computer systems. Um, and I took it because I thought that was where I was going. I took it because it felt to my systems programmer self to be more rigorous and serious and important and, um, and, uh, and yeah, just more, more easily grappled with than this sort of airy-fairy stuff that involves human beings. Um, which is an interesting kind of you know, problem, I think, right? So, I mean, over time, things, over th times things change. So I moved from essentially being the most systemsy person in research labs that were focused on human issues to, oddly enough, at Xerox, the most human-oriented person in a lab that focused on, focused on systems issues. Um, but that was a transition that took a long time, it took a good 10 years, in particular it took a two good 10 years um, for me to uh, internalize myself. I remember when I was at Zurich Europark in Cambridge in England, I was visited by some friends um, who, uh, who teased me for the fact that I was working in a human-computer interaction lab, doing all that soft user interface stuff. You know, which is, and, is, and this is stuff that I got to sort of think about a little more when I came to UCI. So, you know, the English academician um, C.P. Snow famously wrote this essay entitled The Two Cultures. It comes from a series of, uh, of, um, of lectures he gave and then sort of published as a book in which he was sort of excoriating in the early part of the 20th century the culture of universities that placed a hard division between, on the one hand, the sciences and, and, and on the other, the humanities, arts, and to an extent, social sciences. And he wasn't simply claiming this as a sort of problem of disciplinary boundaries that were being policed, but as a cultural issue. That is, that as scientists, we don't feel that we need to engage with, um, uh, with, with other broader issues of, um, of social practice and cultural practice. Um, I was even, I should be careful what I say when I'm on camera, I was even at a, at a talk yesterday, actually, at this event I was, I was doing, an, in, an industry event where the cryptographer giving the last talk said, OK, well, now we're going to talk about something mathematical. After all, that stuff about people. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so you know, the, I think, and oddly enough, that sort of problem of two cultures is one that I found myself caught in where I, when I was trying to, make a, trying to make a transition. One of the things that I love about having come to UCI, and UCI in particular, is the fact that we um, pay less attention to also raise than, um, than, than many other institutions and make it easier to work across them. And make it easier because, after all, uh, you know, one of the things that I try to teach my students is the way in which... Um, information technology, you know, that we could study from a long time as an effort or for a long time as from an engineering perspective, you know, is something that is now deeply caught up in issues of social justice, of civic participation and social values. That, these, that the technologies that we create are the ones through which we will all live, not simply um, uh, ways to, uh, you know, to, to burnish, the, bur burnish the bottom line or, or 
um, and who operates as a platform for, for new startup ventures. Um, and to be able to understand that, I think, requires finding a position that, uh, that reorients us towards disciplinary divisions and disciplinary separations. So one of the reasons that I've been so particularly happy here at UCI is that it feels to me like a place where that question of what the sort of social justice concerns are that surround information technology and how it is we might approach a study of and the development of novel technologies from a perspective that incorporates social, political and cultural values, you know, this is a place where we can, where we can do that. In the 1970s in Scandinavia, um, a group of computer scientists uh, uh, sort of pioneered some of this, some of this study. So the context was that um, laws had been, pla had been passed um, in Sweden and Norway that required the involvement of trades unions in, the, um, in any decisions about uh, the, the shaping of the workplace. And people realized that information technology and computerization was probably the biggest thing that was going to happen in anybody's workplace in the next you know, um, several decades. And so what we needed to find were ways to develop computer systems and to engage people in the development of those systems um, that you know, recognized workplace democracy and workplace, f and, and, and workplace uh, um, issues of, of equity as central and could not see the development of technology as being separate from or distinguished from those, nor could you see it as purely the province of a bunch of people with degrees that say computer science on them, but rather it had to be a partnership, it had to be a, a thoroughgoing um, um, social, social engagement. And, and so the participatory design movement which started there and has sort of spread all over the world is one that, um, one that does that. I think right now, particularly in our current economic climate here in California, you know, we talk about the value that the university has for, um, for society. And in computer science, that often manifests itself as discussions about economic prosperity, about saying the university in computer science education, that's the place where, that's what's going to give us the next Google, that's what's going to give us the next Facebook, it's what's going to give us the next Microsoft. Uh, we don't say that so much anymore. Um, but, uh, you know, that's where, that, you know, the, the value of computer science education and what it contributes to California has a contribution to the bottom line. It's a contribution in terms of startups, innovation, and economic prosperity. Um, I, that, that's not the approach that motivates my research, nor the approach that motivates my teaching. Um, you know, I, just numerically, most of my students are not even going to be working for high-tech firms, never mind starting high-tech firms. Or if they are, I think actually if you look at our figures, you know, lots of people go into programming jobs, but they are not typically in them after five years. However, they are all going to be voters in California. They are going to make decisions and choices about the kinds of information technologies we use and the, and the purposes to which we put them. They are all going to make decisions and have to make informed decisions about, um, develop, about how we think about you know, questions such as network neutrality, how we think about questions such as access to information resources and so forth. And helping people be responsible citizens in a digital world means bridging the kind of disciplinary divides that normally render questions of, as I say, civic participation, social values, social justice, and politics um, separate from the engineering aspect. So we're trying to sort of put those, put those back together. And, you know, if there's something that matters to me, that's what matters to me. Um, you know, so to wind up, in the last, uh, you know, 12 years, 12-ish years, 12 and counting since I, since I arrived here, you know, I've been able and delight, been delighted to be able to work with a whole bunch of people who are similarly invested across the university in, um, in questioning some of those disciplinary boundaries and creating a sort of alter an educational and pedagogical alternative that starts to put these things together. I'm delighted that I get to live a fairly integrated life, right, in which my own values and politics and, um, and you know, the concerns that animate me and get me up in the morning are also the ones that I get to prosecute through the day in partnership with, uh, with, with students and colleagues. I try in long meetings and when filling out long, tedious forms to remember that, about what the things that are uh, valuable and, and that are uh, um, fortunate about the situation I'm in. And so I encourage all of you with whom I interact on a daily basis to remind me of that as often as possible. Okay, I haven't been tricking, tracking time, but hopefully we do have time for uh, questions.
So now Paul will be uh, calling on um, any of you. If you have questions, please raise your hand, and we'll find a way to get a mic to you. And uh, once the mic's in your hand, then um, I guess then you can ask your question. Or not, it's a lovely day out. <laughs> what is your faith belief that matters to you? It was interesting you started out saying that you had some question there, and you might mention something later, and I didn't hear it. Oh, so. okay. Um, um, well, I said that most people, or many of many of the people I know who went through a Jesuit education, are, are um, emerged either as priests or militant atheists, and I fall much more into the militant atheist um, camp. Um, the the sort of significance of that for later on, perhaps, is the is is the um, the way in which it became uh, any kind of like position on that for me became intertwined with certain kinds of questions about career choice and decisions and and and, and, and trajectories I followed. So. You know, my 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 faith lies much more in in people and politics than it does in higher powers. Hi, um, I was actually just listening to NPR the other day, and I heard an article about uh, Tim Berners Lee and his concern about net neutrality and service providers. You know, kind of dictating or censoring what, you know, goes on to the internet and through the web. And so I guess um, as an information professional and um, my knowledge of IT literacy or the lack thereof, I wondered if you could just speak to the kinds of constraints and challenges that you see right now for the public and what you think maybe the solutions are to those. Uh, that's a great question. Um, let's see. Great question to which I'm struggling to find an answer. And so I, I think part of the difficulty that we, that, that we face is that we're dealing with a technology that, uh, you know, a technology that is still emerging that we're still grappling with. And the kinds of policy, I mean, those are important policy questions that people need to be able to understand and that we don't actually have a good understanding even of what the infrastructures are and, and, and what's, you know, going on there. You know, I, you know, my, my current book project is around what we're calling the materialities of information that tries to think a little bit about the, um, the relationship between two levels of description of things like the internet. One level which is at the, you know, which focuses on, you know, bits on wires and one that focuses on the, um, the details of what it is we think we can do when we get online. And the difficulty we have is that that's a, a really difficult um, um, separation. People don't have a good understanding of what the relationship is between the kinds of choices, values, and outcomes that uh, you know of, of technology policy at the high level and the details of what's actually going on down at the, down at the, the low level. Um, I always remember a case when I was in Edinburgh working as a system administrator. People kept coming into my office one day complaining that their email was not getting through to the United States. Uh, and I had to explain that there were three points of connection between the UK academic network and the US academic network, um, two transatlantic cables and one satellite connection. And that week, one of the transatlantic cables had come loose and was flapping around somewhere in the North Atlantic with a ship <laughs> desperately chasing after it. And the satellite base station in Virginia that was the US end of the satellite connection had been struck by lightning and was not operating. And so their email was not actually carried by the email ferries but went across. And I think when we talk about network neut net neutrality, um, the difficulty we have is in trying to understand what the um, responsibilities are of the various kinds of players and what that stuff actually looks like at the network level. Um, because, you know, there's one kind of rhetoric about, uh, about providers and their infrastructure investments and another kind of rhetoric about equality of access and openness. And we kind of don't, under, don't have good ways of putting the two of those together. So that's the real challenge, I think, is that we have two completely separate levels of description and understanding, and we don't have good ways of, ways of putting them together. Um, so. so I have a question, um, if you don't mind. So uh, the governor recently um, he remarked $10 million of the funding that's going to UC to online education. And uh, in addition, uh, Daryl Steinberg is putting forward a bill that would require colleges and universities to uh, honor courses taken over MOOCs like Coursera 
And I was wondering if you had any perspective on online education and its role in the academy. Um, there is no question that online education is a big part of our future. I think the question is what sort of part of our future we want to make it. Um, a friend of mine has been proposing that we need to stop using the term, term like MOOC, which is actually in itself for a whole variety of reasons, a deeply disturbing term, to stop calling those like large classes, you know, the massively open online classes, and instead, instead call them, you know, very low teacher to student ratio education. Right? <laughs> that's the way to talk, to, to express what's going on there. Um, and I think that's really important because I think what it does is it brings up the question of what sort of values there are. I think there, right, we have all sorts of incredibly compelling and powerful examples of um, educational opportunities opened up by the provision of um, online education, both in the small and the large. We have ways in which we are bringing our knowledge and our practices to new communities in ways that are um, Im tremendously empowering. And I think we want to try to embrace all the ways that technology helps us to do that. What I think is more problematic is where we pursue online educational initiatives, not as a way of broadening the base and broadening participation, but rather as a way of sort of value engineering the, um, the you know, the, the university's activities and to, and to say, well, you know, that's, the, that's a more cost effective mechanism than actual contact between human beings. Um, so, so it's clearly got a role. I think the real question is, what's the role that we want to um, uh, want to ascribe to it? Which of the various kind of paths do we want to follow, and how do we make it part of the larger offering rather than you know a, a new, um, more cost-effective way to you know, you know to to resolve the problem of bonds and seats or whatever it is. Yeah, I have two questions. One is, um, I'm curious about the Jesuit education. Like, if you feel it, it prepared you well, or was it, a, and if so, what about it now as an educator you might take from it? But, and the other one was, um, what's the most satisfying thing about your job now? Kind of looking for those aha moments when you feel the greatest kind of sense of pleasure in what you're doing. Um. Okay, so to take the first first question, I I, um, I will give the Jesuits I must give the Jesuits due credit. I think that was you know a, a, an, an excellent beginning. As I say, I think the value the 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 um, this importance that they placed on education in general and on sort of knowledge and learning for its own sake is something that has absolutely stayed with me. The idea that um, and you would probably have to ask my students um, whether it's how it how it manifests itself. Uh, now, but you know, it's a fairly aggressive model, um, not a violent model, but uh, but 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 um, uh, 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 but very rigorous. And I think my guess, my suspicion actually is that the focus on um, uh, on on theory in my current work is actually a consequence, not least of the way in which I was you know, brought up and, and educated by educated by them. Um, As for what I find most particularly rewarding, um, I have, so let's see, right now I have, uh, I have a couple of students who are just finishing up their PhDs. I've got a couple of students on the, on the job market. Um, I notice as I look back over my, my, especially my PhD students, they tend to have gone in waves in different kinds of generations. So what we're currently, what's currently winding up is a generation of students who really pushed me in new directions and brought um, new ways of thinking and new kinds of models into, into my research. Um, and in many ways, that's the thing that I find most, most gratifying is, the, is when I realize how much um, I have gotten to learn from my interactions with those students and how much my own work has evolved, developed, and strengthened over the 12 years I've been here because of the, the, the influence and the things that the students bring, bring into me. It seems kind of trite to say that you know, I learn as much from them as they do from me, but it's actually been tremendously influential in my own, in my own work. And seeing that moment as they sort of like, you know, move from being my students to being my colleagues, uh, is, um, is, is tremendously gratifying. So it tends to be in those sort of personal interactions. I really like what you said about 
learning to be bilingual or if I can phrase multilingual to be able to engage academics that are definitely outside of your expertise or area of expertise. But I'm wondering what advice would you give to those of us that are outside of this computational informatics field? Um, because it, it seems to me that um, learning how to use the power of, 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 of that can come about through computation um, is enabling a lot of research fields like biology, so a lot of social sciences to do very innovative work. But I'm wondering what advice would you give to those of us outside of outside of informatics to um, to be able to learn how to speak that or to to engage um, computer scientists better? Yeah. So. In many ways, you know, uh, I was lucky in terms of the times when I did this. So, you know, I said that the first computer I encountered was a, was a Commodore PET. You turned that computer on and it went beep once. And then it was, you know, it said, OK. It said, OK, ready, I think. And, um, and, and what you were sitting at at that point, what you were typing at was the programming system, right? So it came, designed, the very first thing you would do is you would type a program in, right? So the idea of using the computer was not playing Minesweeper or reading Facebook or all the things that I started, you know, they, 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 that are maybe your first thing you do with the computer now. It's the first thing, indeed the only thing you could do if you bought it was to write computer programs. Um, and so the automatic mode of encounter was one of creation making things. Um, and, and you know, that was true for pretty much all of the computers of that generation. It's no longer true now. In fact, it's really kind of sad that when you buy a computer, you all not, all, invariably have to go and like download extra stuff. You actually have to take, you know, go out of your way to do the thing that was sort of natural for me at that point, which was to make something. So, you know, the primer, the first piece of advice I always have for people is, you know, learn to write computer programs. They don't have to be very complicated. They don't have to be very difficult. You know, it's, it's, it's easy to write, a, you know, two-line Python program. And even in just writing a two-line Python program, you will understand something about the way in which computers work and computer scientists think. And for better or worse, um, you know, the way that computer scientists think affects all of us all the time. Um, and indeed engaging with people and thinking with them, thinking with the people who are building information systems that you know, constrain and enable all sorts of things in our world uh, uh, is a really important uh, position for us all to be able to sort of strive for and you know, just teach yourself to program in Python. Really good start. <laughs> Uh, hi, I have a question. Uh, given your sort of extensive experience on both sides of the Atlantic in industry, in a research context, and here at UCI in a research teaching context, uh, I really would, would love to hear your sort of impressions about the industry in light of the sort of uh, response to the CEO of Yahoo to change the work environment for employees, as well as Cheryl Sternberg's you know, call, particularly to women. Uh, to what extent is an industry, uh, an industry that uh, is open to the sort of the intellectual labor of women? Um. Sorry, I'm, I'm smiling for reasons I will, reasons I will get to. I mean. <laughs> Well, well, so yesterday, yesterday I was at this event and it was uh, 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 organized at, at, at Intel, and it was entitled "The Future of Fear," and it was the the starting point of three days of deliberations they're doing around sort of questions of privacy and security and data management and things like that. And one of my uh, uh, colleagues, you know, sent me a photograph of myself on stage with the other panelists at the at the end, you know, noting the future of fear will be brought to you by six middle-aged white men. Um, this is not only the future of fear, but also the present. Uh, so, I, and, and indeed, it's true that as I looked around the room, uh, you know, that was a, that was a, you know, 85%, no, probably more, yeah, um, percent audience, uh, male audience. So, um, you know, 
changes have taken place, we're in a better position than we are than we are now. I, what our approach, I would say, here at Irvine, and, and you know, is something that actually in informatics we take great pride in. So there is an annual survey of um, uh, of computer science and information science uh, education programs called the Talby Survey that's run by the Major Professional Association. And one of the things it measures is female participation at all levels from undergraduate enrollment through to you know the upper reaches of the faculty. And we have traditionally been very proud um, on this campus that you know, ICS beats the Talby survey in terms of female participation at every level from undergraduate enrollment. I used to be able to say to dean, but since we, since Deborah Richardson stepped down in House Durham took over, I can no longer point out that we even have, that we do better at the dean level too. Um, and that informatics beats ICS, right? So there's Talby and then there's ICS, there's informatics, and we're very proud of, proud of that. But I think actually the import, what's important about that and significant about it in terms of our programs is that the reason we do that is precisely because we try to take a broad-based view of, of, of information technology and its consequences. Right? It's about trying to, again, recognize the importance of the way in which technology shapes our world. That actually motivates different kinds of participation. Um, it motivates uh, uh, broader openness in the program and um, and that becomes a mutually beneficial thing, right? More women in the program, more uh, broader, sort of more equitable base, produces a better program, and 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 vice versa. Um, I I actually think I mean there's a lot of stuff people have been saying about Marissa Meyer and her decision at Yahoo to uh, to sort of shift the working basis. Uh, you know, even at the same time as I've done a lot of research myself on distance edu not, not distance education, but distance work and collaborative work and online work. Um, I find myself continually trying to express to my students the need to actually come in and be around and work with each work with each other. Um, it's a challenge in computer science. It used to be the case that you know people would have to come into the lab because that's where all the computers were and that's where the fast machines were and things like that. And now anybody who wants to can sit with a computer that's easily fast enough for any of their needs in any coffee shop with a network connection fast enough for, for their needs again um, and and don't necessarily get the camaraderie of the of of the lab, um, and so I, do, I think actually we should be careful not to overread the the Marissa Meyer Yahoo thing. That's not so much about industry; it's about Yahoo, which um, is at a particular moment in its own history. Uh, but I do think the questions of participation are ones that are extremely important for us. That means, I think, again, this attempt to recognize that there are multiple ways to treat the computational artifact, more than simply as an educational one, more than, or as an engineering one, more than simply as a, a mathematical one, and a more holistic treatment, and a more uh, a, a, an approach that allows for a multiplicity of treatments is one that, um, that invites more in different sorts of participation, and we find that extremely important. There are no more questions. Now, let me remind you to get a questionnaire. We'd love it if you fill it out and turn it in. Let's thank Paul Dorish for Thank you.